Okay, we're ready to do our little demonstration up there. We'll show you what some of that shooting does. Look, this, this is a little uh, <laughs> miniature shooting machine we made. Just got to stop at the back so he can't cheat on the draw. What kind of penetration did he get? Uh, he stuck about two, two and a half foot of air out the other side. If his shaft had been smaller, I think it went through. <laughs> now this first one is, uh, that, that's the low FOC? Yeah. That one, this one, okay, is 5% is FOC on this little soda straw. And the thing to watch is just the quality of the flight. Uh, this is actually, most of the guys that are shooting compounds are shooting lower FOC than this now. And FOC has such a marked effect on how an error flies uh, some of your traditional errors won't be much higher than that, although most of them will run from 6 to 10 percent is probably uh, pretty common with, with uh, the wood shafts particularly. Yeah, go ahead and take a shot and just watch what the flight looks like. Well, that one caught up and sailed pretty good. Half the time they go off at, a, at an angle, so that one actually... Well, from here, <laughs> I'm not aiming at this curtain. The arrow took off and dripped. Yeah, and, the, the, and you never know which way it's going to go when we shoot these because the weight's close to the center of the arrow. Whichever way it starts, it wants, that's the part of the arrow that it wants to follow. Now, this arrow, we have doubled the weight of the arrow and moved it all to the front end. And still, we only have about 21.4% yeah, 21 FOC there. But you see the quality of the flight that it makes just changing the FOC. Quite a, quite a stark difference. Well, let's cover just a couple more things here. And then we're going to have a, uh, yeah, Tro Troy's going to do a, a little demonstration on some tuning. And you'll see a little more shots and get an idea of what FOC is going to do. There are a number of other advantages just besides the quality of flight <clears throat> that we pick up off the Ultra EFOC errors. Now, I've tried this time and time again, and some people just say, well, that doesn't make any sense, but it works. You can take two arrows that are identical in external dimensions with different FOC. It takes a little juggling to be able to do that, but you can get the weight and everything else exactly the same. The high FOC error will shoot substantially flatter at long range than the low FOC error. And for me, out of 40 yards, it's more than a foot difference in drop between a high FOC and a normal FOC error that are exactly identical except for the distribution of weight. That's because the error comes out of paradox faster. And it's saving a lot of energy because of that that can be used for flatter flight downrange. And if you're using a fairly heavy error, of course, the heavier the error is, the more it retains that velocity downrange or the slower it loses speed as it goes downrange. But some of the other advantages you hit is that we found you can use very, very, very small fletchings. The higher the FOC gets, the smaller the fletching is. This particular pattern, like those and those, are of the A and A fletch. That's a straight fletch with a straight taper. It's got a little turbulator in front of it. Uh, and of course, you see how see it in comparison to a 190 Grizzly, so you get an idea of the size of the fletching we're looking at. They look kind of funny. Uh, the longer, the higher you get the FOC, that moves the balance point of the air up and gives you a longer rear steering arm. So you now need much less fletching in order to be able to exert the same amount of pressure or enough pressure to be able to stabilize the error and fly. Reducing the fletching also reduces the weight on the back of the error, boosting the FOC more. But it's also reducing the size of the drag or the amount of drag on the back, which is boosting that genuine, true FOC of the error and fly. We're taking drag off the back of the error, so the true FOC, the center of pressure of the error, is going to be higher in flight. So it actually has an effect on the real, genuine uh, FOC in flight. But we found some other really interesting things as we started working with these. You have a lot less drift in a crosswind because there's less effect on the back of the fletching. Uh, you will see on a crosswind, your arrow will tack at an angle. But as soon as it hits, it corrects virtually instantly because the back of the shaft is so light. The point just pulls it right back in. Whereas on a normal FOC, the whole arrow drifts and you end up having to aim way over in a crosswind, which uh, you have much, much less uh, offset with a high FOC. Uh, an additional advantage we hit is that they're very quiet in flight. Uh, the, this particular cut with a straight back is even quieter than uh, two-inch uh, parabolics were. 
And we did that by just going down range. We had a bunch of people do it, even, even a lot of people never even shot a bow, and hide behind the corner of a building and have people shoot the arrows by, a whole series of them. Which one was quietest? One, two, three, four, five. And, and everybody came up with the same one as being the quieter fletching every time we've tried it. It is a noticeable difference in the sound of the fletching. But probably the biggest advantage, at least one of the biggest I've found with it, may be the fact that it's virtually impervious to water. You can take this fletching, and we've done it with shooting machines, put it in a bucket of water, soak it 30 minutes, take it out, don't even shake the water off, put it back in, it'll shoot the same hole at 40 yards. They're short, they're stiff, and water doesn't affect them. And part of it is because they don't have to exert much pressure. Obviously, what little effect the water's having does not affect the amount of pressure that the feathers are generating on the back of the shaft, and it's perfectly adequate to steer the air. So being able to hunt in wet weather, not worrying about your feathers, to me, is a, is a pretty big advantage at times. Now, just a little series of slides here. These are individual frames taken from a video. These are consecutive frames. We're not leaving some frames out in between. And we talked about the paradox, how fast a uh, EFOC error comes out of paradox. But people don't realize how much flex there is on impact with the shaft and the rapid recovery of the uh, EFOC errors, I think is one of the things that helps boost their penetration quite a lot. And this is a moose femur, and right here you see the broadhead approach. This is the next frame where it's impact, and this is a single bevel head on here. You can see it cut it and created the split. But look at the multiple images of the shaft. That's how violently it's vibrating in impact. Here's the very next frame. The vibration has slowed down some, still blurred in the frame. Here's the next frame, slowed more, and virtually back to straight on the next frame. How fast has that occurred? There's the bone chip still in the air from the break in the bone. Occurs almost instantly. Now this is a, we've got two more slides here to look at to show some of the more interesting effects on penetration that we've run into. This is with an ultra EFOC error that weighs 655 grains, 31.4% FOC. And these are on shots broadside onto Buffalo. And we did quite a large, extensive uh, number of shots with this. And what we're showing here is that we've got the minimum penetration and the maximum penetration, the average penetration, and the median, the midpoint uh, for all of the shots in penetration. And then we compared it to all of the errors, 725 to 900 grains from the same bow uh, that's been shot into buffalo under the same condition and the same size buffalo. These were all done on uh, really big trophy bull buffalo here. And you can see that this light ultra EFOC era outperformed all these. Now these all have the same broadhead on them. So we decided to take it one further. And this is that same era compared to a really well tried, uh, proven buffalo setup. Same broadhead on it. It's 967.6 grains, and just barely into the EFOC range at 19.8. And you can see how well this 655 grain error compares to this big heavy buffalo error, even though it's giving up, what, 312 grains in weight. And we're getting that performance increase by the increase in the FOC. So we've got an 11.6 difference in FOC. And what I found, I, and, and I had them in, but the, the presentation is long enough as it is. I've been, I've been tracking over a period of time what happens as far as percent penetration gain per 1% gain in FOC. And what we're finding is that the higher the FOC is, for every 1% increase, the greater the penetration gain. So that if you're going from 19% to 20 or 20 to 21, you have a little bit of gain. But if you're going from 28 to 29, you've got a big gain in penetration per, per percent increase in FOC. So it is a, a really, uh, some of the things I want to investigate a little more, but what it's looking like at this upper range at FOC is that for every 1% increase in FOC, we're getting a little over 7% increase in penetration. Now down at the other end of it down here, we're only getting about 3.5% gain for every 1% increase. So it, it obviously is a progressive thing. So this FOC effect is, is I, I, that's why I'm trying to push the FOC as high as I can to see what 
if it continues up those lines. If it does, when you get errors like, like Troy's built up now, uh, where he's broke 40% FOC, I, I'm really interested to see what the penetration would be. I, I think it's going to be astronomical. Maestro, you're on. We're going to talk about tuning errors, and I'm going to turn it over to him.